Professor Banu Mahanti. He's Associate Chair at the Department of Physics and Astronomy, Michigan State University. He obtained his master's degree in physics in 1963 from the University of Allahabad and his PhD from the University of California, Riverside in 1968. He has served Michigan State University in various capacities for nearly four decades as assistant professor from 1970 to 76, associate professor from 1977 to 81, and professor from 82 onward. He has been a visiting professor at Bangalore, Mumbai, JNU, New Delhi, Madras, University of Antwerp in Belgium, and the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, Germany, and the Argonne National Laboratory in the US. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society. Please help me welcome Professor Mahanti. Good morning. Uh, um, theme of the uh, conference, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, sort of energy and uh, charge transfer in thermoelectric nanowares. And uh, this is the work I have been involved. Uh, we have a, a project for the last several years trying to get the best thermoelectric materials for uh, energy applications. And clearly, the nano systems are supposed to be playing an important role. And uh, sort of a link is, uh, if you think about nanoscience and technology, clearly, the quantum computing has to come from that area. All the advancements of uh, nanoscience has to be fully involved in, uh, in, in the quantum computing, as you learn from all the talks. Even in the classical computing, as Professor Wolfgang Bauer mentioned, as the system becomes smaller and smaller, uh, the, the physics of nanoscience is, has to be incorporated in uh, transports and dissipations and so on. But for my interest is, of course, energy and power transfer. And the reason is, of course, uh, motivation for our uh, program is that if you take a very quick look at the entire fossil fuel combustion through heat engines, you generate uh, power at about 30 to 40 percent efficiency. The rest it goes as very low grade heat. And if you uh, sort of uh, several estimates is four, 14 terawatts. The idea is to uh, get part of that uh, waste heat to uh, thermoelectric. And the way we look at this thermoelectricity is a basically a, a particle machine instead of uh, this guy. And question is how we can make it extremely efficient and thereby get as much as possible. So that's the idea. And uh, the outline of my talk is essentially nobody even 10 years ago, I did not know myself what thermoelectric was. So we perhaps, so I'll just give you a one phase essential feature of what a thermoelectric is. And I'll talk about, since efficiency is the big game, what is the efficiency and what is needed to get a perfect machine, ideal machine. Of course, we cannot violate laws of thermodynamics. It has to be within the Carnot efficiency, uh, since you are converting heat to some work. But even within that, how can I get perfect one? Then what can the nanostructures do, helping us to achieve that uh, uh, efficiency? And I'll just a couple of very interesting experiments recently carried out uh, in several labs, in, one in Caltech, one at Berkeley, and uh, other one I don't remember, on molecules and nanowares to look at their response to heat uh, temperature gradient and thermoelectric, and then I'll have some very quick summary and maybe what is going in the future. <clears throat> so uh, essentially, we all know about uh, standard Carnot engines, so you have a hot source and a cold uh, source, and we, try and we want to transfer heat from this through a machine, a working gas, and we uh, exchange heat here, then adiabatic compression, and then release it here. So, um, but it's all done in equilibrium. The system is always in thermal equilibrium. Of course, if you do perfect thermal equilibrium, it would take infinite time. So you do it a little bit faster. So in this process, of course, you dissipate energy. So you don't get the perfect uh, efficiency. So the same idea is here. I have a hot source, cold source. I'll have particles, which I'll call electrons. And for the sake of convenience, we also talk about holes, as you will. 
and I exchange particles and holes from hot to cold end. And in the process, I carry energy. And hopefully, uh, because they carry charge, I can use the charge transfer to generate a current or a voltage, which can be reused. So that's the idea of a thermoelectric machine. So a little bit of uh, basic physics here. So I have, think of this little uh, red element as a thermoelectric element. And I apply an uh, electric field or a potential gradient, delta V, or a temperature gradient. Then I have an uh, electrical current, which I call J, and a heat current I call Q. And so there is some exchange of currents back and forth. And the uh, uh, electrical current is, of course, the standard sigma E, electrical conductivity. But there is this, what is, the, uh, uh, what is important for thermoelectricity is a cross coupling where in the presence of a temperature gradient, I'll have an electrical current. And that constant proportionality for the sake of convenience is written as sigma s. Uh, and s is called thermopower, or thermoelectric coefficient. And the q is the heat current. In the same way, there'll be a standard uh, 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 thermal conductivity, kappa. Also, there'll be, uh, if you apply a field, there'll be some heat current due to cross coupling. I'll be mostly interested in this, and the use is you can do this. Uh, either you have a temperature gradient which can pass a current, so that would be like a power generation, uh, or you can pass a current and use it to cool. So you can use the thermoelectric element as uh, either a, a power generator or a, 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 a refrigeration. In fact, some of the uh, car uh, uh, cooling, car in, uh, the seats cooling is a bunch of thermoelectric elements. Um, this object is going to play a very important role in all the physics and uh, efficiency of the machines. And this is called ZT, Z, uh, and it's just the Z is a combination of several quantities. Uh, one is the electronic conductivity, electrical conductivity. And S is the thermal power, is square of that. And that plays an important role. And that's the operating temperature. If it's a hot and, and cold, T is roughly the average. And kappa is the thermal conductivity. So you can see, uh, so easily, if you can see just intuitively, if I have a very highly thermal, uh, conducting, thermal conducting material, a temperature gradient, I'll sort of short circuit most of my uh, energy source. I won't be able to produce enough uh, power in the system. The problem is, of course, as you'll see, ZT is a dimensionless number. And the idea is to get the best ZT. So you will see all the papers, everywhere there'll be a plot of ZT and how they're doing it, how good one is doing. And that's a sort of a cartoon here is what you do. You take this thermoelectric element, you put a little burner, and you uh, light. So it's converting heat to light. OK, so let me give you some numbers, because that's going to be very important. Uh, first thing is to what is the, uh, uh, if you go back and look at this one very quickly, what is called open circuit. If I don't have any current, J is equal to 0, so there's a relationship between the field and the temperature gradient. So delta T produces a field, or a delta V. So if you go there, so essentially E, S is delta V over delta T, so basically volts per Kelvin. And typically, we talk about microvolts. It's not a big effect. If you can, of course, a volts per Kelvin, it will be great. But typically, it's microvolts per Kelvin. And it comes about from a fundamental unit. You can sort of think of EV as energy, KBT as energy. You uh, use 25 millivolts, we know it's 300 Kelvin. And from there, you can get KV over E is uh, 25 millivolts over Kelvin. Or uh, if you divide by that, it's about 83. So this is a fundamental unit. And we measure the thermal power in units of that. Question is uh, how large I can make it as a function of uh, is it five times or one time. So, so that's the number, or dimension and number. Uh, typically, metals, which are uh, very good conductors, which one would love to use them because ZT is proportional to the conductivity, I can make it very large. Unfortunately, due to a simple physics, they uh, don't have large thermal power. That's the KB T83, but there is a Pauli suppression factor, KBT over EF. That gives you one microvolt, and it's proportional to square of that is no good. So metal is not very good. And uh, one way to think about it also, 
uh, which is the way we think in physics, that I have a, a metal, zero temperature, I have no, basically no excitation, so nothing happens. So I heat it up, I excite some electrons from below the Fermi surface to above, I call them sort of electrons. Those which are below, I call them holes. They both have energy, they carry energy, but when they carry energy, but they have opposite charge effectively. So they cancel each other out, and that essentially gives to almost zero. So in many metals, if the number of electrons and the holes are identical, then you don't get any form of power. So the game is to make them as disbalanced as possible. So, so, the, so therefore, metals are not good. Uh, so we have to find something else. It turns out uh, narrow band gap semiconductors are the best because they sort of optimize. If you have a wide band gap semiconductor, conductivity is very less. And metals are bad. So somewhere in between are these narrow band gap semiconductors. Uh, typically, when I say narrow band gap, it's about 0.2, 0 0.3 EV band gap. And uh, so they are the best uh, thermoelectrics. And because they have about 200, yeah, you can even make it 500 sometimes. And this is a sort of a uh, uh, thing which we have to worry about if you are going to make a device out of this. Because if it's a hot end, these are cold end. And if I have only, uh, as I just mentioned, that electrons carry um, uh, uh, what we call n-type semiconductors. Ele electron have negative and holes have positive. And imagine yourself, uh, here is a hot end. Electrons will come here, holes will come here. So um, uh, then, uh, now suppose I had only both uh, electrons, then I'll have carry the current, but there's no way I can make a current flow. So in this process, if I have holes, and electrons, maybe there's a little. So first the hot holes come in here, and the electrons come in there, but electron going there means the current is flowing here. So all, what is happening is in the end, when you, the electrons and holes flow, there is actually a current in this. So that's the geometry people use. They call it a binary. So you have thousands of these doubles, PNs, 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 put them together, put a hot plate and a cold plate, then you have a thermoelectric machine. So that's how it is usually synthesized, uh, uh, made uh, devices out of it. So the many uses, uh, as I also uh, yesterday's, we had a nice talk by Professor Rao. You could also use them. He doesn't use it, though. Uh, you can take these explosives, make a mini bomb, and blow it up. And so one end, you can heat it up and use the thermoelectrics current to detect how, much, uh, how many uh, active molecules you have. Uh, but he said he's not using thermoelectrics, he's using pyroelectrics. But I suspect thermoelectrics also would be equally good. I guess pyroelectrics are also responsible when you heat it up, they produce, I think, what are the pyroelectrics? Some electric field must be producing it. Uh, but, uh, uh, and we have been interested uh, several uh, at uh, low temperature thermoelectrics for some time. Uh, we have some, uh, I, I'll show you in later a new system which was discovered at Michigan State at low temperature, one of the top, very good low temperature systems, but also last few years on power generation. And that's where the main interest is now. Uh, in addition to, of course, uh, thermoelectrics, there are many uh, other similar physics the machines, the thermionics, where you uh, by just, uh, excite electrons across a vacuum gap. There, the nice thing is that your uh, gap, you can make it very, very low in uh, thermal conductivity. So you can reduce that thermal. Uh, so, but they're not uh, uh, that uh, popular now. I mean, the people are working, but I don't know much about them. Of course, this is a famous case where I think Professor uh, Patel's statement was that you know, it's a perfect machine, I believe. Nature has made very little dissipation in the system both photovoltaics and um, photo, uh, um, photosynthesis and my, uh, electron transfers in redox systems. Okay, here is a little uh, figure, and this is what we, I will uh, discuss mostly. So I said you can use the thermoelectrics for either cooling. So there is efficiency in cooling called coefficient of performance. Let me not worry about that, although I have a figure for this. And uh, uh, in efficiency in power generation. So eta. Uh, you can see it's proportional to this prefactor, which is just the Carnot efficiency, 1 minus Tc over T A. So that's the best you can make, times a function. It looks complicated, but in that function appears this Zt. So um, 
if zt, that dimensionless number, can be made very large, or in, say in theory, there's nothing which forbids to be infinite, so zt is infinite, then you find you approach the Carnot efficiency. So uh, bigger ma you make zt, bigger efficient machines you have. So this is the same thing is plotted for refrigeration. Here is a zt being plotted, and here are the two uh, uh, temperature uh, difference you have to maintain and cool. So this is a higher temperature, this is a low temperature. And uh, you can see of a, for a given zt, for delta t less, I have more efficient. And these horizontal lines are the standard refrigerants. I don't know much about R134a. But this simply says that uh, uh, if you want to uh, cool across a 20 degree centigrade gradient, uh, you can beat the, this system if you have GT of 3. So GT of 3 is sort of a holy grail now. And as I'll show you, uh, there's some slow movement towards that number. But uh, most of them are in this regime. So that's not competing. OK, so let's do a little bit of a, what is a perfect machine? That's a very simple idea. I have eta is eta carno times this. So gt is infinite, as I said. If I make infinity, then uh, this becomes 1. I get that. So what is the gt? gt, as I said, is a dimensionless number. Depends on all the uh, electronic and lattice or phononic properties of the system. S square, sigma t, this, that. So you have some conductivity, some thermal power, some temperature. So only way I can make zt an infinite if I have to make kappa lattice 0, kappa electron. Because they're all positive quantities. They can't cancel, 0. So if phonon, uh, which is the lattice uh, uh, condu uh, thermal conductivity, the lattice carrying the heat uh, from one end to the other end, if I can scatter them all, and it will be a, what is called perfect phonon glass. So a perfect phonon glass to make this guy 0. And to make uh, K electronic zero, I'll have what I will call is ideal electron machine. So, uh, so for the electronic physics, right? so I have kappa electron zero, I'll add ideal machine. So uh, I'll talk, so if, say, I can turn off the lattice, switch off the lattice, they don't carry any heat, that dissipation path is gone. And then I make this charge and energy transport without dissipation by doing this. I have an infinite. So the question is, what, what is meaning? How do I do this? Or, or, or what are the ideas involved? OK, so what is the reality, of course? Uh, ZT infinity is somewhere there, up on the universe, high up there. Uh, so for many, many years, uh, ZT was sort of hovering around it, uh, about 1. And that's the reason why uh, in 70s, uh, say late 60s, 70s, all the excitement and research in thermoelectric died in USA and all over the world. Russians still continued producing lots of new materials, but somehow the third JT never uh, uh, got beyond one. Uh, but uh, there are some theoretical ideas which were pushed in middle 90s, and uh, then uh, which sort of got people excited to try new ideas, new things. And then this uh, MBE SAM, uh, growth came in. And so this is an MBE made sample of bismuth uh, uh, telluride and antimony telluride. We did some work on this. And they, their quantum wells, they showed a pretty large, uh, yeah. so suddenly there's a big jump. So there's something interesting was happening there. Then uh, there was some. Uh, this is the one which I wanted to mention to you. I won't talk about it today also. Uh, this is bulk materials. So this is the one which was discovered in, uh, in uh, late 90s, I would say, uh, in Michigan State called Sismuth Bisium Telluride. That's the sort of the best, was known the best low temperature bulk material. So this is a sort of a quantum dot system. Uh, <laughs> so for bulk materials, still it is a, a good one. Uh, then. Um, the lead telluride, lead selenide, quantum dots uh, gave a, a two, which is pretty good number at room temperature. Uh, then uh, uh, this was another interesting system, which uh, we were involved at Michigan State, which discovered uh, last four years, I would say, if 1.8 at 800 Kelvin. It's promising materials, they're bulk materials, but um, uh, it's very hard to work with this. 
but people like to have big chunk of thermoelectric materials to make gen uh, generators, power supplies, and so on. Uh, but um, so but I, I will only I won't talk about it, but I'll just go to the extreme uh, nano range and and see what uh, is the physics one can use to get this. So I want to uh, reduce this uh, power, uh, uh, sort of that GT into two quantities, the thermal conductivity, which is the denominator, and the numerator is what is called power factor, S square sigma. Uh, they can be connected, but uh, people hope that they will uh, uh, control this one separately and that one. Oh, there is a point I forgot. Because they are semiconductors, the thermal conductivity of a semiconductor is uh, dominated by lattice. If you think of a thermal con total thermal conductivity, you'll find about 80% is lattice through and 20% in this, whereas in a metal, almost all through the electrons. So, so that also gives you a handle where uh, you can manipulate that 80% that I said, this phonon glass idea, reduce that by a factor of four, so that helps you. And then the electron part you can also tune in differently. So that is uh, a good thing in a semiconductor. So anyway, nanosystems we don't have to talk about. We had a lot of uh, lectures, uh, this whole conference, and about one to 10, 10 nanometer, about 10 to 100 angstrom length scale. And uh, we know uh, uh, quantum confinement effects on electron becomes pronounced as you decrease the length scale. And um, so we should expect something interesting that is happening when I reduce to 10 to 20 angstroms. And uh, we'll uh, talk about quantum Rars uh, wires today. Uh, Wells is what uh, was proposed there. And also, as I also mentioned, that uh, some new materials are being discovered where you have bulk inside which nanoparticles are coming in or nano wires are forming, and they also can be controlled. If you can control them, their synthesis, then they are going to be very interesting, promising materials also. Okay, just to tell you a little bit about the temperature energy scale, this is what uh, we learned in our basic quantum mechanics. First, you have a bulk material, assume a free electron moving in all three directions. Then in a quantum uh, where I confine two directions. I just, for the sake of complete uh, simplicity, I take A over A over A and the le length in this direction. So the transverse length where they are quantized is characterized with this energy scale. If I have a well, of course, only one direction is uh, quantized, and this direction, two directions, they are, of course, free particles. So if you just take a, roughly an estimate of a nanometer length scale and a mass of electron, that's about 1,000 Kelvin. So uh, at high temperature, we are operating 800 Kelvin. This is important to uh, think about, means if there are a couple of channels along the transverse direction, I have to worry about both of them. Uh, but uh, so that's sort of an uh, energy scale. And so why does it affect the transport? Uh, because uh, one of the important quantities which sort of controls the transport, and many, in fact, many physical properties of electron systems is this density of states, how many energy levels accessible to uh, the electron in a given energy range ED. So this is the standard parabolic, poorly drawn, three-dimensional. Then you go to two-dimensional, you, you make some kinks, some uh, structures in this, and 1D, you make that. So you can see here, it's a very interesting, uh, yeah, simple, suppose my Fermi energy is, was somewhere here, the density of state is almost flat. So when I excite uh, uh, electrons thermally, I create a holes and electrons, because this is so flat, I'll have the, roughly the same number of electrons and holes. So that's the reason why a metal in 3D is not very good. On the other hand, imagine in this system, if I put in here uh, the Fermi energy, because there's an enormous difference in the density of states above and below, I will have different number of electrons and holes. So that's essentially the, really the physics, which tells you why I'm going from here to here, to here, I'll have some changes in the property. And that led to a very simple calculation, which actually was the initiator of a lot of funding in this area, was a calculation by a student of uh, Milly Dresselhaus, who is sort of a, now a big shot, even she is uh, sort of involved in all thermoelectric research now in USA. Many, uh, so what she found in a very simple calculation that if you go from a bulk to a 2D to a 1D material, 
and you reduce uh, this length, confinement length, then you can get an enormous increase in this CT. So from one, to, if you think, is this. So that sort of get people excited, and now that the fabrications of quantum dots and quantum wares being made, they started attempting to test this idea. So it turns out this is very naive theorist calculation. Many things are sort of put under the rug, uh, and uh, so, uh, but certainly the idea is that if you uh, publish a paper like this, it was published in 96, I believe, and uh, you are also well known, you might excite other people to work and also funding to come. So there are many, in fact, part of our reason we got funding was the, uh, trying to understand this stuff. And as I said, this thermal power is proposed for the derivative of the density of states uh, near the Fermi energy, if it's flat, it's zero, if it's a sharp singularity or some structure, then I can get less. Okay, so I will tell you a couple of experiments. So what is the attempt to do this? Uh, and I will tell you a beautiful experiment done uh, in molecules, just a simple molecule. Of course, eventually the idea will be to put all these molecules on a, on a surface and use them as your thermoelectric machines. And then I'll talk about two experiments in nanowares and um, some theoretical ideas or calculations here. Okay, here is a nice uh, work which was done, published in Science by Reddy, it's a good, big group. And what they did was to take a substrate of gold, which they could then uh, make it hot or cold temperature, and then uh, in between, so there's a, a tip, a STM tip coming from the top, and then trapped a molecule. And these molecules they could control, uh, essentially benzene rings, two, one, two, three, as you do that, of course, we know the electronic, uh, the, there has to be an electronic path in which they are trying to um, monitor because the electrons from one metal to other metal has to go through that and depending on that, where the electron level is, either it can go like an electron or the, it can go like a hole and you can really measure that. And that's sort of beautiful experiment and, this, uh, exp and you can change this. So what they did is first, uh, they, without any temperature gradient, and brought it in and measured the current voltage, made sure there was some link. Then that, uh, the, once they had the link, they stopped there, then they heated the sample, and then they measured. So here is some experiment where they measured the voltage, no molecules, this is the sort of a bar, and then in the presence of molecule, they did it. And then of course, what they're doing is uh, they're pulling it, and as the distance increases, of course, eventually it snaps and you get the voltage sound. gone. Here, this is gone here. So uh, then uh, they looked at this, uh, what are the voltage as different temperatures. As you can see, that different temperature gradient is increasing. So uh, this is 30 degrees, this is 10, 0, 10. So there is something thermoelectric is happening because I'm changing the temperature gradient across this, I'm uh, increasing that. So that was sort of their clue that they're measuring so the thermoelectric response, not of that molecule really, it's of that system, because they, they all form a uh, combined group. And of course, these are one molecule experiments, so they had to do millions or thousands. These are statistics. As you can see, the delta T changing, this whole thing moves. And uh, they also measured uh, the voltage as a function of temperature. From there, they could figure out the, uh, this thermal power. It's not big, it's not big, it's only about uh, 10, microvolts, but uh, who knows, maybe I can put a beautiful array of these molecules nicely ordered, which is possible by self-assembly, I can get a much bigger response out of it. But something interesting happens in, from this measurement. It's not, of course, practical applications, but you can use it as a, um, a spectroscopy using thermal power. <laughs> Idea is the following, and this was a, a simple theoretical calculation. You take two metals, put in a uh, molecule, some state here, then you can compute the sort of a uh, transmission coefficient, standard quantum mechanics. And as you change the uh, Fermi energy of the uh, metal, this are the, the, these are the homo of the molecule. This is homo means highest occupied molecular orbitals. Luma means lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. These are the two levels. As you tune, as the uh, Fermi energy hits this, there's a sort of a resonance transfer. Now you can use that and compute the um, uh, uh, thermal power, pretty straightforward. Essentially, once you have a temperature gradient, there's a formula you can calculate thermal power as a function of the chemical potential, and you plot it. 
What you find is interestingly that uh, now you know the, your measurement, you put it in, so you can locate where the homo or lumo is vis-a-vis -vis the metal funnel. So it's a nice uh, experiment of, uh, which tells us how I can use this nano thermoelectricity for doing spectroscopic measurements of molecule levels. May not be the most efficient, but that's a Okay, so what is happening in the, uh, these are real well, attempt to make systems which are going to be useful in the future. Uh, these are, also we learned a little bit about uh, this system called uh, anodic alumina. So you take aluminum oxide by some means, which I don't know. They make these beautiful holes, goes right through that, pretty uniform in size. And then once you do that, then you fill up those holes with uh, th thermoelectric materials. The point is these are, of course, uh, 70 nanometers to uh, bigger than that. They're not very nano, 70 to 100. And there are other issues here. Then when you put, uh, try to put metals in, there is no guarantee it has to go uh, on this end and that end. So sometimes it doesn't have contacts. So there's some ideas where you change, fluctuate the voltage, come back and forth and fill it up. But uh, this at attempts, uh, these were earlier attempts, 2003. So you can see it's uh, about six years back, seven, five years back or six years back. And this is, in fact, nothing much happened. So people lost some hope in this uh, thermal power through nanowares. Uh, there's other problems also. In 1D, as we know, there's a lot of scattering, electron-electron interaction effects. So the, uh, they're not very popular. Until uh, last two years, some extremely interesting experiments came, so I think there's a lot of new revival of it. So these are, of course, beautiful samples made by the Caltech group of Heath, and this paper came out. So these are silicon. Silicon is, you know, the whole idea is to make silicon because we have a lot of silicon as our part of computing world. Silicon dioxide, silicon is cheap. So they wanted to make silicon nanowares, and this green stuff, which you can't see, I guess, from the back, are a bunch of parallel nanowares, which they developed the technique to make. That's the, and all, of course, this is the machinery of measurement. You can see world is quite hard. So uh, whether it's an efficient way of using energy, we don't know, because the amount of money and energy you spend to build this is perhaps much, much larger than that power output. But what you found was a very interesting result. Uh, and there, uh, what, when you made this nanowares of silicon, bulk silicon's thermal conductivity is over 150 watt per minute. Then uh, what you find here, K, uh, here I'm plotting uh, bulk by nanoware is um, a dramatic about factors of 100, 200, things like that. So uh, translated to a simple language, when I make nanowares, the phonon, the heat conductivity reduces dramatically by two hours of magnitude. And that's, I think, is a big gain in this whole field. If you can reduce that phonon conductivity by a factor of 100, because this is too big. This was, so therefore, bulk silicon is not good. It's, uh, this GT is 0.01. But by reducing this by 150 by a factor of 100, you have a tremendous increased possibility. So that's point number one. The point number two is also which is unique and which I don't think, uh, I don't understand very well, neither the people need some theory to be uh, done carefully. They have some ideas that if you think about um, bulk systems, this is the thermal power, S square of that, there's an enormous enhancement, there's some sort of resonant effect in the near the 200 temperature range. That's again part of the nanoware system that uh, what is no, here there's an the, the electron thermal power, but electrons interact with the phonons also. There's something called phonon drag. And so there is sort of a, because of the nanoware, the phonon scattering is changed so this leads to this effect. That's what they guess. Uh, I have not thought through it much, but if this experiment is right, you can see there is an enormous enhancement in the S itself. So you have reduced the thermal conductivity by a factor of 100. You have increased S by this, so you, have, you can see that you have really made a big gain. In fact, what you find is uh, this GT is what I want, is you can see here 200 from almost point 0.1 uh, we were less than that, to one. So this is making a big excitement because silicon getting GT1 is, I think, is going to be very useful 
uh, for, the, uh, for this uh, area. If there's only one experiment, you always doubt. You never believe an experimentalist unless somebody's done independent. Of course, you never believe a theorist anyway. So, uh, but the, this was the other experiment which was done. Uh, I'll just, uh, see here is, unlike the Caltech group, where they grew beautiful nanowares, very well characterized surfaces, these people uh, had two experiments where very well characterized, nice nanoware surface. This is silicon nanowares. And here there's another one which this was rough. A certain length scale, there's some modulations, rough interface or surface. And these are these nanowares. One thing they found, which was common with both the, the other experiment, there was again a dramatic reduction in the thermal conductivity as you went from 115 nanometers uh, diameter nanoware to 50. And uh, several, uh, concentration, several uh, concentrations were used. And so these experiments need to be, again, carefully analyzed. But the net effect is a reduction in the thermal conductivity by a large amount. And what they do now compare with what is called, this is the amorphous silicon. They're coming pretty close. Uh, now you can see here that, uh, again, I want to mention what is the uh, status here. Uh, this is an important, uh, yeah. see, so on this side, we are plotting this curve is uh, the thermal conductivity, bulk to nanoware. So that means you are reducing, again, uh, we're talking about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 2, 100 orders of magnitude reduction. And, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, electronic conductivities are not good, as we expect. Bulk silicon is a beautiful uh, conduct, you know, has, long mean tree path and good trans transport. And so what happens here, this uh, S squared, the denominator, sorry, the numerator here, is reduced by a factor of 10. So you gain through this, you lose through that, so the net upshot is uh, about 0.5. So again, you have gone from 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.05 range to a fat 0.5. So this is very uh, helpful. And uh, so now people are uh, trying to use the same technique, uh, although silicon was good, but to start with silicon was not a very good thermoelectric as a bulk. So why not take a very good one, like bismuth telluride or something else, and make nanowares? Whether it's possible or not, we don't know, but that's the plan for the future. So what about theory? Where is the theoretical idea? So I said, you know, we are looking for a perfect machine. So where is that perfect machine? So, uh, so where does theory stand? Um, uh, one thing we have to do as a theorist is we're talking about nanowares, we're talking about room temperatures, and uh, the question is the transport. If, you know, to do theory, I must understand whether the transport is quantum transport or ballistic load transport or diffusive, where the electron moves, scatters with phonons, there's a mean free path, and then the nanowares, uh, our diameters are large compared to mean free path, are small, so I have to worry about those. So one calculation which was done nicely uh, recently uh, is, is taking some actual calculations, good calculations, taking uh, some sort of a channels, a transistors, if you think about silicon channels, oxide barriers, and if you just naively think about two extreme limits, uh, if there's a ballistic movement of electrons going through these channels, then you have this quantum conductance, or inverse is resistance, 2 e square over h, then the number of channels the electron is going. So that, that, so that essentially tells us the ballistic limit. Then on the other hand, if you have a diffusive, the electron goes, scatters around, there is a mean free path, then we all know from our transport theory, it, uh, resistance is proposed to L. So what the people did was a good calculation using Green's function techniques, where you then put these uh, layers and do, they did reasonably well some electron phonon, electron impurity scattering, then you compute, uh, this resistance versus this, the only in a very small one nanometer to 1.5 nanometer is what there is anyway. So if your channels are uh, two, three nanometers, and uh, maybe of course this way is very long, so it's not necessarily, most likely for practical use, we are not in the so-called ballistic regime, but rather in the um, diffusive regime. So we have to do diffusive calculations. And one way to do them, these calculations, uh, which we do is, uh, oh, sorry, I'm using this one. Using, uh, this is the only slide, I, I won't go through the equations. So, 
I'll just tell you, uh, so this is what we do. That's, uh, as a theorist, we do have to do equations, calculations, computers. As Professor Wolfgang Bauer said, we do use heavy computations. So, but this is all is needed in a calculation. Uh, so you have to, the, the whole, these are all Fermi functions, conductivity, thermal power, uh, electrical, uh, thermal conductivity. This is a point I'm going to bring back in a minute. And everything depends on this uh, factor, which called sigma e, transport function, which depends on the electronic band structure. This depends on the band structure. This depends on the scattering. So uh, the standard thing is, uh, in fact, I'll show you one result we do, uh, uh, that we take full ab initio band structure calculations for these materials and compute this very carefully. And this one, we don't have much of a handle. We are still struggling to understand this tau of e. And uh, then we put it in and then do calculations and see how they are. OK, here is something I wanted to mention, because I, you, I'll come back to this. This is the same old equation I wrote down in the beginning. And this is an important uh, uh, thing, which is missed by many people. This uh, didn't matter for metals, but it's becoming very important for this uh, thermoelectrics. Uh, if you look at current, it's this. And this is a heat current. Now imagine I have a, a constant current, because most of the measurements are done at constant current. Uh, let's say constant current, but j is equal to 0. Then given a temperature gradient, I have a field generated internally in the system. Now I go back and put that uh, field in this heat equation. Then what I get is an uh, effective conductivity, which is the constant current conductivity, thermal carried by the electrons uh, compared to the constant field. So this is what we experimentally measure. This is normally we use theoretical calculations. But however, there is an important result here that these two, um, this has to be positive by definition. They are response functions. This is positive. And so the question is how best this can come. Because experimentally, this is what is used. And I told you to get a perfect thermoelectric, I must make this 0, which means these two guys perfectly cancel. So what is the physics such that these two guys will perfectly cancel? So my electronic thermal conductivity at constant current is zero. I get the best electronic uh, thermoelectric. So, so that's the uh, idea. So there is, this is a calculation, which I, it was done in a nanoware, for silicon nanoware. As a theorist, you can see, theorists are much more optimistic. So um, you get, you can change the concentrations. You can change the, you know, they change the size. And we are now limited, unless we get next generation computers, to treat about 300 particles of initial calculations. But we need about 1,000 particles, which is sort of a next game. Uh, we can't handle them. But what we find, that depending on the thermal conductivity of the lattice, you can get GTs of. But I, I believe there are other issues. These numbers are too high from theory. Uh, uh, but we'll see how uh, these numbers come down to uh, uh, relate to experiment. One thing you should know that these are sort of much narrower nanowares. Uh, it is, um, uh, I forget uh, what is, there was some size here. It's 1.1 1, 1 .1, uh, nanometers, but the actual experiments are, uh, yeah, here is 3 and there's 1.1. 1 .1, because I can't do big nanowares that well. Okay. So now I have two slides to tell you what, where are we going. But it's still a perfect thermoelectric. They're all four, five. I need infinite. So uh, here is an idea which came, was proposed. Uh, and this is where the theorist's idea of making that uh, nano. Now imagine, and this is perhaps what nature has done. Uh, if I know my, uh, uh, I think you referred to all this entropies. We, this is what, this is von Neumann entropy, which we use in our entropy of uh, uh, electron uh, moving in a, uh, um, it's a electron in a solid. And uh, Fermi Dirac distribution function is this. And you can see that this is related to entropy. If I just change the entropy by adding a particle, essentially this E minus mu over TR. So the idea is that if I take the electron hopping from side to side as it carries charge and energy, if I can guarantee that this guy, E minus mu r over TR, is constant. I have a temperature gradient, high temperature, low temperature, temperature gradient here. And typically, uh, I, have, uh, I have an energy level of the electron. Now, if I can tune my chemical potential by doing some, applying some fields, and so that I keep this as a constant, then 
I have essentially, I add a particle at a site, but I don't change the entropy, so it's an adiabatic transport. So if, and as we know from our physics, adiabatic transport is no dissipation. So that was their idea, that if I can make a uh, thermoelectric where this is the energy level in which the electron is moving, which is of course a single energy, an electron doesn't move in single energy, uh, a single energy, but I tune as a, it goes from hot end to the cold end, I connect it to something and I change the chemical potential, then I'll get uh, a perfect machine, adiabatic, therefore there'll be no loss in the electronic system, so I should get, if there is no phonons in the system, infinity. A beautiful idea, in fact, they all got some funding to try this, has not been successful, but uh, I want to link that idea to what we calculate, as I, and this is what I told you last two slides back, the electronic thermal conductivity as a function of J has two pieces. What you find that if you do this idea of change the chemical potential uh, and the t uh, with the temperature, demanding this to be a constant, this is what the calculation is, then uh, you find that uh, GT at, uh, uh, here is, as you tune the energy levels, you find both, uh, one thing you find that the thermal electrical conductivity goes to zero, which means this, uh, this guy exactly cancels that, and you get enormous this. So this is an idea which maybe 20 years from now might be feasible. Uh, I had a slightly different idea that uh, don't, change the, um, uh, uh, don't change the chemical potential, which is again connecting, but maybe allow for different energy levels, the hot and cold end, but that would be of course Again, one shot, you change the energy levels so that E minus mu is a constant. So you, you synthesize charge, maybe nature has done that, makes uh, various molecules as sites where the electron goes here, 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 optimally, so that uh, that factor remains constant, there's no entropy involved, change. So, uh, but this is an idea which is still, I like it, and I think uh, this Linke is uh, working on it, I talked with him once in a while. Humphrey, who is a graduate student, proposed this. C has moved on, uh, working on quantum transport, but let us see. Okay, so that is the end of my talk. Um, two concepts, uh, what I think I, I would like you to take, it, take out from this uh, lecture is the concept of a phonon glass, which is becoming better and better with these uh, nanoparticles with surface roughness. Then uh, adiabatic charge transport, which is a good idea, but uh, still not possible. Nanowires are pretty close to the phonon glass. You can reduce even below the amorphous silicon limit. But electron transport, a long way to go. Uh, experiments are uh, done at 1.3. Maybe uh, we need them. Uh, the theorists are working in this. Experimentalists are 10 range. And we need better transport calculations, particularly the understanding of the relaxation time and sort of the coherent interplay of the phonons in these nanoparticles and systems and electrons, electron structures of that. And uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Mahanti. There's time for some questions. The uh, electric conductivity is not affected. Then. Electrical conductivity yeah. is Doesn't not affected. Doesn't go down to. It doesn't matter. Well, let's see. If, uh, if electrical conductivity, if I can, in the ideal situation, phonons are very gone, let us say. Electrical conductivity can be less, but if I make the denominator zero. Exactly zero. You're exactly saying, okay. zero. So, so I, I have to go, that approach that zero faster than the electrical conductivity. Than the other. Yeah. Because now if the, also the numerator goes to zero in the same way, yeah. then. But uh, let me just, this calculation is not necessarily, uh, yeah, they didn't. You are right. I, uh, they should have a calculation of conductivity, which I think they have, I forgot. It does go down. Yeah. Sir, there was that uh, expression where, uh, I think uh, that's what uh, he was referring to, where the denominator was becoming zero. Uh -huh. So. ZT was actually getting to be infinity. Is, is that really possible? I mean, has this been experimentally realized? No, 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 experimentally not realized. Experimentally, what is realized, I think, in fact, uh, 
See, the, the, in, a, in a problem, in experiment, unfortunately, when you measure the, uh, let's say ZT, is S squared you can measure, sigma you measure, T you measure, then uh, here is kappa, right? Unfortunately, uh, thermoconductor doesn't care whether you're getting to electrons and so on, you measure the total, okay? So once you measure the total, so you don't, it's a phonon, it's a lattice, plus this one, uh, that k electron minus uh, s square sigma t. I measure both, all, so I don't know how to do it uh, from experimentally. But one way to do that is use some, inject some theory, or, uh, or do, do the following, uh, uh, which people do, there is, uh, which is not quite right. They simply use some old uh, rules called widerman franz which breaks down really dramatically uh, in this limit when this exactly cancels. All these metal theories are wrong. Uh, so what one could do is to estimate this exp uh, theoretically, experiment, uh, estimate this theoretically, and see how they are. That's what we have been approaching. And what we find even in this, let tell you right, we haven't done it in this, uh, because I didn't do calculations in nanoware. I'll, I can go back and check it. Uh, but in let tell you right, we could get this to be a 50% reduction. Well, not, but you know that 50% is easy. But next 50% uh, is 10 times harder, and the next one is 100 times harder, sort of. 